If you guys would, um, please stand and, and join me.
Good morning. I don't know about you guys, but I needed that this morning, for sure. So welcome to Element. For those of you who don't know who I am, sorry, I'm terrible with microphones. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Christy Morangi. I'm in charge of essentially children's through 12th grade now. <laughs> so uh, here at Element, and I love it. So uh, that is who I am. Whether you are joining us online or in person, we're so grateful that you're here, especially if you're new. If you're here with us this morning for the first time, please come and say hello to us at the Welcome Center after service, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. If you're joining us virtually, you can see our digital connect card linked to this video or say hello in the chat area. 
So the biggest thing to know about Element is that we love Jesus. Our hope is that when you think about Element, you think of a people who love Jesus and strive to connect more people to him. Our aim is to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community, and planting churches. So um, since I am in charge of the E-Families ministry, it's safe to assume when I get up here and do announcements that that's all you're going to hear about. But we have a lot going on. Uh, so even if you don't have kids or uh, if your kids have kids, we could still use your help with the, the stuff that I'm going to talk about here with our upcoming events. So don't tune out just yet. So today, uh, after church at 1.30, we're inviting all our students in grades 6 through 12 to an end of summer pool party and barbecue. If you would like, yes, woo. <laughs> if you would like your student to participate, please come see me at the Welcome Center after service, and we can get you the address and then the other details. Our next youth event after that is what we are calling an almost all-nighter because I don't want to sleep on the floor. So, uh, and who wants to do that when you can sleep in your own comfy bed? So Friday, September 16th, we are going to start at 6 p.m. in the barn with dinner, and then we're going to fill the rest of the night up with junk food, ridiculous activities, some more junk food, probably some Nerf guns and pool noodles, and then we'll top it all off with more junk food before sending your teens home at midnight. <laughs> You're welcome. Sign-ups are in the Church Center app and today's Uversion notes. Last but certainly not least, we are so excited as the days grow closer to our next change their view. Uh, we call it CTV for short. CTV is a chance for kids and parents to come together as a family and hopefully change the view of church being boring and stuffing or parents being boring and, boring and stuffy or just rule enforcers. And you will join in as your family sings, gets silly, makes crafts, and plays games. And then you get to lead your own family in devotions with booklets designed to help you in your family's ministry. So CTV is going to be September 28th through September 30th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. each night. So we need volunteers for all of these things. Uh, and that's where you guys without kids or with grown kids can help. So a lot of our usual volunteers have young families, and it's important for us to allow them to participate in the event instead of helping work it. Some of the jobs are facilitating games, uh, walking groups through a craft, these are CTV things, or making and serving snacks and desserts. If this sounds like something you could help with and we teach you everything you need to know, please come and see us after service at the Welcome Center. So those are all the announcements for this morning. So now, if you will please stand and say hello to the people around you. Thanks. Because I'm a strong woman. I heard, are you going to, are you, did you just say you're going to Jack Saban? You said, yeah. okay. Did he invite you all to go with him after service? Is that what it was? All right. You all sit together. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, you know. You know, my wife, uh, my wife tells me, and so does Michael Reed sometimes, that after I've been gone a couple weeks and I come back, she goes, you come in like really hot and heavy, like I talk really fast. So I'm going to try to not do that today. It's very difficult for me. Uh, so who came to trivia on Friday night? All right. I'm not going to ask you if you didn't, but you guys have fun? 
how, how sad is it when you walk away going, I don't know anything? <laughs> That's the point of trivia. I mean, you can start off in trivia those first two rounds. You're like first place. You hit that fourth or fifth round. You're in last place. You're like, what happened? Trivia. That's what happened. So if you came, I hope you enjoyed it. We might do it again. We'll see. You guys seem to have a good time. Yeah! I have one announcement for you, and it is not trivia. It is baptisms. Baptisms are next week. You sh it's going to be nicer than today, according to, but that's like, you know, seven days out, and we never know, like, a day out what it's going to be like. But right now, it says to be in the 80s. It's going to be a nice day. Element is going to provide tri-tip and bread and beans and drinks <laughs> within re salsa. And within reason, all right? So we're going to provide that for you, and then you are going to bring something. If your last name is A through L, you are going to bring a side of some sort. Don't ask me what that means. I don't eat them anyway. If your last name is M through Z, you're going to bring a dessert. I do eat those. So you should bring some. We want everybody to come to baptisms. Even if you're just there to watch the couple people get dunked and then leave, that's great. We just want to support them as a family. But really, if you want to come and eat, hang out, get to know some people maybe you haven't gotten to know, it's going to be a great day. And we love to do these as large parties. There will be directions on the communion tables next week where to go. We're not going to tell you where to park. You've got to find your own parking space. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's easy. But whatever, it's going to be a great day. So put on your calendar. Make sure you come. Did I get it all? Yes. Yes. I, I look at the communications director in the back to make sure I say what I'm supposed to say. And she says, yes. Welcome to Element. If you are new, there are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. There are sermon notes on the communion tables around the room. They look like this. And what you're going to get here is the verses we're covering today. Yeah. I'm like, am I doing this backwards? No, I'm doing it right. I haven't been here in two weeks. I don't know what's going on. On the bottom, if you have a question, you can write down a question from today or just any question you might have about the Bible. On the back, you get a short recap of what we're talking about. And on the bottom, you get these questions to talk to your friends, your family, your gospel community about so we could go back and reflect on what we talk about today. If you have a, sm yeah. if you have a, if you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. You click on More and then Events in Uversion. We will come up by GPS in your smart device, and you will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, everything that goes with today's message. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? I encouraged him. It's my fault. <laughs> this is a section of a verse out of context. You get out of context, out of context. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. There you go. Buck up. Figure it out. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would teach us what it means to be a people whose focus is upon you and not upon ourselves. That when we step into situations that we don't understand, that bring us anxiety or worries or unneeded fears, that you would help us in those moments by your Spirit leading us to guide us to the places where we focus on what we should focus upon, and that we would trust you in the midst of all of these things. Amen. All right, you guys have a seat. We are doing this sermon series called Never Read a Bible Verse because we actually want you to read more than one Bible verse when you read the Bible. Uh, we want you to take more than a verse and they stick on a mug or a t-shirt or a piece of embroidery because the Bible is more than nightly news and little sound bites. The Bible is about God's rescue of us, how we run from him, what God did to bring us back to himself. It's about our great salvation that we have received. And we have looked at a lot of different things during this series so far. We have talked about women in the church. That was fun. That brought some anxiety. Uh, there, We did some verses about the government government and creation and working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We've talked about, does the Bible make atheists? And today, I'm going to go a little bit of a different route with you. Because instead of giving you three points, what I'm going to do is kind of just talk with you. And I want to encourage you. When I say talk with you, I'm going to talk at you. But we're going to walk through some things, and I want to encourage you by the end of this. Maybe to see some things in our life that seem so overwhelming at times don't have to be so much. I'm not going to say that all your anxiety and and all of your worries and all of your fears are going to go away because I don't know if that's true or not. But I can tell you what it means to have a better focus on who God is and what the gospel brings. So today we are going to talk about anxiety. Uh, I was reading this thing that said that blue is a calming color. 
So that's why I wore it for you today. You'd be like, oh, I feel so much more calm as he's talking about this. Sometimes people will look at things in the Bible and they take these verses out of context. Oh, do not be anxious about anything, as if it's all upon you just to force it down and get rid of it. People will even take Jesus' words out of context. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, people have taken those verses and said, there you go. Just figure it out, buck it up, and, and get over it. Taking out a context, that can do a lot of damage to people when they struggle through a whole lot of things. And so we need to see what the Bible actually says about anxiety. And first off, what I would like to do is say that anxiety is real. I want to acknowledge that. And if you struggle with it, please understand that you are not alone. Uh, therapists and psychologists, they will tell you there's many reasons for people when they have anxiety. It could be hormones. It could be sleep deficiency. It could just be something you ate wrong the night before, but it could be a whole lot of other things that go really down deep inside of us. Sometimes anxiety comes about because we don't even understand our own emotions. And many people who sit in the midst of anxiety and worry and fear, they start to feel like they are the only ones because especially in a place like a church, we feel like we have to have it all worked out. That Oh, we're doing so good. Oh, how are you doing? Fine. Great. I'm wonderful. Don't ask me about anything else because I'm doing great. We don't want to deal with what's really going on inside of us. And a lot of advice out there in regard to anxiety is just not helpful. I went through and I probably found nine different articles by Christians, and they were like three steps to walk away from anxiety, five steps how not to be anxious, nine habits of worry-free people. That's not always helpful. It's, it's just not. And I don't know if I'm going to be helpful this morning. I hope I am. But I will tell you, we should at least read the verses in the Bible about anxiety in context. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious about anything. We have to understand what this is actually referring to. The word anxious there means to have cares. And obviously Paul is not telling us not to care about anything. And the connotation of where this is going, what Paul is saying is sometimes we become overly focused on one thing that is not the most important thing because the most important thing is the gospel. In context, if you have an ESV, this verse starts a little before chapter 4 verse 6 and it goes like this. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Thing. Why? Because the Lord's at hand. Where are we looking? Looking to the Lord. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The International Children's Bible says it like this. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. With thankful hearts, offer up your prayers and requests to God. This is a way of saying, don't focus inward. Many times when anxiety hits, we focus on the thing that is bringing anxiety, and we get overwhelmed more and more and more to where we just melt down. What it's saying is don't focus inward, we focus outward towards God. People will say to others, in the midst of anxiety or doubt, we'll just trust God. And if you start with anxiety, you're like, what do you think I'm trying to do? Right? People say, oh, just trust the Bible. Great advice. But you know, you're like, what do you think I'm actually trying to do in this moment? I'm trying to trust the Bible. I'm trying to trust the words of God. Jesus in Matthew 6, as he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, he will talk about anxiousness and worry and needless fear. And he says it comes down to three things. And I'm going to give you these, but please don't tune me out when I say them because he is going somewhere that's deeper than we think when we just hear these. First off, he says anxiousness can come about because of a lack of faith. Because sometimes this lack of faith, it is actually good for us because it reveals what we're putting our trust in. Lack of faith in the end of trust is not a deal breaker because our God holds us in his hands when we stumble, when we wobble around in that. And so we have to realize we can recognize the places where anxiety can actually make our faith stronger when rightly understood. Second thing, anxiety can be a confused priority. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount will say in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. He reminds us that everything that we need to exist will be given to us by God himself. And then number three, anxiousness can come about because of a lack of focus. If you are constantly thinking about tomorrow, you will fail to live in today as God intended to the glory of God. And I'm not saying that some issues in our life with anxiety are not medical. Sometimes they are. But when we start to go through things, now today everybody runs to the Internet. And the Internet can be a curse and a blessing. My wife and I were watching a TV show last night. We're like, who is that? Who, what was that? 
that person in? She's all, boom, that person wasn't, da, da, da. I'm like, internet's amazing. But the internet can also be a curse because when something's wrong, you got a disease, something's gone, you go to the internet. And there are a thousand different websites telling you thousands of different things. Oh, you got cancer because you can't remember your friend's name. You don't have cancer because you can't remember your friend's name. A glass of wine is good for you a day. A glass of wine is going to kill you. Eggs are good. Eggs are bad. I am still looking for that one website that says bacon and cookies are the perfect diet. <laughs> Haven't found it yet. But that would be awesome. But the more you look at the, computer, the, the internet, the more confused and depressed you can become. And so Jesus, as a rabbi, is trying to deal with the issues of people in his day. And he is saying that as long as we are living in tomorrow, what could be, what might be, what's going to happen in that conversation, or when I talk to that person, we're never going to live the life today that he intends. Now, at Element, we spend a lot of time talking about what the gospel is. And the purpose in that is not just to get you to be able to repeat the gospel. It's that you would know it well enough that you will practically live that out. When something comes your way, you will step into that in a way that has the gospel as the center of what you do. So what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's the announcement of that good news. Gospel means an announcement of good news. And so this is an announcement that Jesus lived the life that we never could have lived. We have all rebelled and want run away from God. And so Jesus lives that life for us and gives his righteousness to us. And then he dies the death that we deserve to die because we have rebelled against God. So Jesus gives us his life and he takes our death upon himself. And then he brings us back into relationship with himself by a work that he himself does. When we get the gospel misunderstood in our minds, it leads to some different things. First off, today people will live in what's called the gospel past. And they think the gospel was all about morality and doing the right things. Oh, remember when America was moral. No, I don't. But remember when it was, oh, it was so great. We should go back to the good old days, gospel past. Other people live in a thing called gospel future. Oh, you know, God's going to come back at the turn of Christ. He's going to smite all my enemies and teach everyone that I was right. As if that's the point, right? That you were right. Seriously, people do that. What we have a fear, I think, of doing is living in gospel present. We're always looking to the past, always looking to the future. But those things of what God has done and what we'll do is meant to encourage us to live in the gospel present today, right now. This moment is meant to be centered upon Jesus. The past is done. The future is secure. How do we live today? And this is what Paul and Jesus are kind of both saying to us. When we become anxious and overwhelmed and worried by something going on, one of the best things we can do is just stop and pause and give yourself like a five-minute timeout to remember what God has done, what God is going to do. And that will give us strength to reset and actually live in the present. It doesn't mean all your anxiety is going to go away. But what it means is we can have a better focus of what's happening so we're not focusing on the anxiety, but we're focusing upon him. And this is why it's important to know the scriptures. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, this isn't a money sermon. Don't worry. I'm not saying, oh, give money and you won't be anxious. That's not what I'm saying at all. But many times we become anxious because we feel insecure. And when we are not trusting Christ in today, in right now, we go to, do I have enough? And if I lose everything, am I still secure? Do I have enough in my own hands? Am I able to take care of myself? And the writer of Hebrews says, that's the wrong focus. Because the focus is not this. The focus is you are secure in Christ. You can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And I don't want that to be your mantra that you walk around and repeat that over and over. But sometimes that is good for us. When you are feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling anxious, when something feels out of control. I mean, poor Mark Pruitt this morning. Everything just fell apart on this poor guy. He had to run home and fix the live stream, which isn't totally fixed. I'm a second off. I know. Don't complain. We see you. Uh, you know, then the, and the sound and the lights and everything. Thing. He's just, and I'm just five minute time out. God, you know, what's going on? Reset me to what's really important right now. And it is worship of you and having us as a corporate body understand the gospel better in how we live. And so you come to this place, it's overwhelming. What do you do? Well, it's good to say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. It may not help at all when you first say it. Like, I don't believe it. Okay, okay. Well, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. The second time you say it, it may not help at all. <laughs> ah, my, my focus isn't focused. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to you? Nothing. 
because God is in control of everything. And the more you remind yourself of these things, the deeper it grows in your souls. God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. And you come to the place where maybe that anxiety can begin to diminish. Again, it might not go away, but it diminishes because your focus becomes where it needs to be. In Mark 4, 37 to 39, Jesus is taking his disciples across a lake. He's had a really tough day. He falls asleep. And this is what it says. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Is that anxiety? How's that about your life sometimes? Everything's overwhelming. Jesus, don't you care if I drown? Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. It was completely calm. Wouldn't that be nice if that was your life? Right? Out of control. What am I doing, Jesus? He's like, quiet, be still. Okay. You know, everything else, quiet, be still. Be amazed. The word quiet there, it means the inability to make noise. It is, it is the inability to speak. It's like hush, hush. And it's a subtle reminder that even when our lives become hectic, God will sometimes use these forces that seem so overwhelming to draw us back to himself. In anxiety, they cried out to Jesus. When we are overwhelmed, instead of focusing on the anxiety, we cry back out to Jesus. Who commands all of creation? He does. He does. Which means he can take care of us if, even when we think everything's going to come tumbling down. And even if it does all come tumbling down, he is still more than able to keep ourselves secure in him in our salvation. Jesus did not say, if you follow me, you'll never have problems. People with no anxiety, they still have problems. I love what John Ortberg writes about this Mark verse. He says, peace doesn't come from finding a lake with no storms. It comes from Jesus being in the boat. I love that. Now open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And this is a Sermon on the Mount. And as we've talked about the second week, a few weeks after that, a couple weeks ago, and then and Steve repeated it again, that when you look at the scriptures, you have to come through and understand what's the big picture? What's the big idea? Everything's pointing to Jesus. And you understand then context. It was written to a particular people in a particular time in a particular way. It's a lot of particulars it, right there. And then when we read the words, words mean things in the context of how they were written. So rather than Jesus just saying, don't be anxious. It's actually in a context. So I want to look at that. And it's long. Matthew 6, 25 to really 34. But it goes like this. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not a more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? Now, the Sermon on the Mount is actually something that Jesus gave multiple times different places in the book of Luke it will say in which one of you by worrying can add a single cubit to his height like if you feel like you're short can worrying about it make you taller nope if you're too tall can worrying about it make you shorter nope it, it does it doesn't work that way worrying doesn't add time to our life fix a problem or add inches to our height he goes on, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So he starts with don't be anxious, and then he will end in verse 34 with, so don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow, you know, that is enough trouble of all its own. And throughout all this, you might think that Jesus' subject here is anxiety and worry, but no. His theme is, where's your focus? Where's your focus? Is it on me or is it on all of these things? Now, as Americans, we love to be cynical and take things out of context. So we'd walk to Jesus and say, really? The answer is just don't be anxious. Don't worry. Be happy. That's what I'm supposed to do in all of this. And if you got in Jesus' face about all of this, he's responding how a rabbi would respond. A rabbi asks you questions to reset you. You're worried about all these things. So Jesus is like, why are you worried about this or this or that? How about this? Where's your focus in this? And he keeps asking questions to draw you back. Why are you so worried. And you might tell him about your journey and your life and what's going on, how the, 
government is messing up your life. I mean, I don't know. How, maybe you have a kid who's making horrible decisions. They're joining a boy band. I don't know, something like that. You know, maybe it's, it's uh, house hunting and an illness that you or someone you love very dearly has that's destroying their life. And you would look at him and say, but I have all these things. Jesus wouldn't just respond with, well, don't be anxious. And then if that's the answer, let's go have lunch. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Figure it out yourself. No. Jesus, again, is trying to reset our thinking. Where is our focus? He doesn't say all these things that we have that we're anxious about are unimportant. He reminds us what is most important is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. In context, you got to get this. Jesus doesn't just say, don't worry, because too often that's too easy to say, and it doesn't solve the issue at all. I read a story about a guy with ALS. It's called Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, ALS is incurable. They don't even know what causes it. There's only one medication approved by the government and will only extend your life maybe up to three months. When somebody gets a diagnosis with ALS, they have two to five years to live, typically. And so a person with ALS, they don't think about, you know, the, the future of all these things I'm going to do tomorrow. They think about feeding tubes and wheelchairs and stuff like that. And so don't worry doesn't hope. But a focus on the grace of God in the midst of that struggle and what's coming can actually bring hope. This end is not your end. It's going to be replaced with joy and hope in the hands of Christ. And I think that's a truth that is good for all of us to remember, all of us to repeat to ourselves, to come alongside us, spend our time thinking about. Maybe you, maybe you lose your job. Maybe you have a relationship that's fallen apart. Maybe it's headed for a disaster of divorce. Maybe there's something that has caused you great worry in your life. Jesus would look at you and he would say, okay, let's take a breath. And let's go back. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Eating and drinking and clothing. I know some of you don't care about your clothes. You can tell by the way you dress. We, we, we got that, right? But, but Jesus starts with food and clothing because those are the basic essentials of life. You may look at that and say, well, my anxiety doesn't come about because of food and clothing and all this. But that's what point Jesus is going to here. That was their anxiety. So he talks about it. It's not just these things. It's all these things that we deal with. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor grab into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not a more value than they do you ever take a step back when you're anxious and just watch the birds i mean birds don't seem to have a care in the world let me watch a bird not like a teenager with a bb gun but you know you just watch the birds and and, and what they're doing they're, they're not carefree because their brains are just tiny it's that god actually takes care of them Psalm 55, verses 4 through 6 says, My heart is in anguish. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. That sounds a little bit like worry and anxiety, right? And I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I'd fly away and be at rest. When anxiety and worry comes, the first thing it seems like we want to do is just run and hide. We want to get away. Jesus reminds them of this and says, I get it. I understand what you are feeling. But birds don't stir up and God takes care of them. Look at them and understand that God takes care of you because you're more valuable than they are. That doesn't mean you don't save for the future. What it means is God takes care of us too, even when things feel so overwhelming in our life. And when you see a bird, you can see the God that takes care of that bird is also going to take care of me. And so Jesus makes these therefore statements. God feeds the birds, he'll feed you. God clothes the flowers of the field, he will clothe you. And he hits the core of that issue. He says, oh, you of little faith. That's not condemnation. That is great sympathy. That's compassion when he says that. And you can't misunderstand that. In the real sense, the biggest problem with worry comes down to our lack of faith, our lack of trust in who God is and what he is doing. But you also have to understand that sometimes when we have this lack of trust or lack of faith, you're not, I don't want you to feel guilty over that because every single person who has ever lived has come to a place where they've had a lack of faith. They've had doubts at some point. I tell you that I have doubts and questions. There's some things in the Bible I have questions about still. I don't give them to you in this series. I don't want to confuse you even more. That'd just be terrible. But I've spent a lot of my life studying and reading the scriptures and walking through things. And I've told you this, that the day I see Jesus face to face, I'm still going to be like, oh, thank God. I mean, thank you. You know, I, yeah, thank, thank you. I, I, I will still feel like that because after all this, I mean, there is a huge relief in, in seeing this. And it's, and it's not because I doubt the existence of who he is, but really my questions come down to, did I understand? the words of the scriptures correctly and more importantly did I teach you correctly to understand what the gospel is so we focus on it and live that out in our lives because it is even rational at times to have faith even in the midst of our anxiety and worries and doubts 
Um, in this article about the guy with ALS, there's another guy with ALS, and he was diagnosed with two to five years to live, and he changed his entire life. He came to believe, he's convinced that Jesus was his only hope, not for healing, but actually for true life. He didn't get angry with God. He begins to worship God, and he actually thanked God for the reminder of what ALS brought, that, that certain things are temporary, but me living with God is going to be eternal. He actually only lives nine months, but he invited everyone around him to come to know the faith that he now professes. His dad, who was an agnostic, actually came to faith in Christ. And I don't know why some tragedies draw some people to Christ and other tragedies destroy people's faith. Some people have this worry and anxiety and they just thrive in the midst of it. But I'm telling you that our focus and where it goes in the midst of our anxiety and fears can lead us to a place of where we actually grow in the midst of those things. Even if the anxiety never goes away. There can still be great growth that happens in the middle of it. Martin Luther said this, Faith is a free surrender and a joyous wager on the unseen, unknown, untested goodness of God. That doesn't mean we don't know if God's good. It means in that next moment, in that next anxiety you go through, we're still wagering that God is still always going to be good. We are to seek God's kingdom above everything else. In one of those stories about the people with ALS, I can't remember which one, uh, but they said when they get up, get up in the morning and they, and they focus on Jesus, they rarely worry about what muscle's going to work and which one's not because they said they find that we're obsessed with Jesus. They seldom worry about this life and these different things around them because they're seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness over everything. Now, let me say that. Let me say something that might actually bring you a little bit of comfort. Everybody worries, okay? Everybody has anxiety at some point and somewhere. I know you think, man, you should make this an Olympic sport because I have gold medal in it all the time, all right? Because I'm so worried. Maybe you can't remember the last time you weren't anxious or worried, and maybe every time you find yourself not worried, you're worried about the thing you should be worrying about, so you worry until you figure out that thing you're supposed to be worrying about. And sometimes when you hear a message like this, or you read an article, or you think, all you think is, I guess I uh, shouldn't worry so much. I guess I just don't trust God enough. And then you worry about how much you worry. Guys, that is not the point. That is not what we're doing. You know, side note, statistically speaking, studies have shown that from birth, 15 to 20 percent of children are just prone to timidity. They just are. They're finicky about foods and new places, and they're shy around strangers. Uh, from birth, their hearts beat faster in new situations. They seem like genetically predisposed to timidity and anxiety and worry and self-reproach. And that is so predictable among mammals that, believe it or not, 15 to 20% of cats have the exact same problem. They are, they are less curious. They're less likely to go to new territory. They want to hang around their, their parents the entire time. They'll only kill smaller rodents. 15 to 20%. Does that mean that, that cats aren't close enough in their relationship with God? No, because no cat is close to God, right? That, we know that, right? <laughs> I think... <Amen. laughs> I think that people who wrestle with deep anxiety and panic attacks can be some of the most courageous people in the world. I, re I really do. And if you, if you are someone who wrestles with chronic worry or anxiety, don't compare yourself with someone who doesn't. That, that's not helpful. Don't waste your time feeling guilty about it. I think guilt might be what's needed by someone who is lying, cheating, lusting, stealing, things like that. But guilt doesn't help when it comes to worry. And if you don't wrestle with worry, don't judge people who do. Don't pass judgment on them. Only God fully understands our inner wiring and why he allows certain people to continue to deal with anxiety and worry the way that he does. I think God's spirit wants to bring peace, but he wants to grow as he wants to move us into being a holy people who reflect him in all that we do. And so if we have a message of don't be anxious and we just say that, that doesn't help because the message of don't be anxious is actually a simple call to say, what am I putting the care of my life into? What am I looking for to my salvation? Jesus reminds us to put our care into God's hands. The Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. John says this, 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. It's this trust journey that we walk through with God in the midst of this. We let love cast out fear. It doesn't mean all the fear is going to go away. But it means that when we focus on him, it does begin to diminish. God gives power and love. And you have to understand this. When I say this, there's a lot of people in our world that says, well, if God really loved me, I wouldn't feel this way. Well, my question is, are you in relationship with him? Is it just something you expect God to do? Or are you actually living in relationship with him? Have you surrendered your life to him? You understand the gospel. You say, the cross and what God did, rest can save me, God. I give my entire life to you. I submit my life to you in relationship. Because if you're not in relationship with God, how can you expect all the benefits of a relationship with him to bring into your life? So, 
are you in relationship with who he is? The Bible is full of places where there is a deep connection between this relationship and love of God and receiving and living in his power. Living with God's spirit means we let the perfect love of God as shown in the gospel wash over us until our fear begins to dissipate. Again, it may not always go away. But I think when our focus comes in the right place, it can begin to diminish. Because God's will is not for intimacy with him to be one more thing you have to worry about in your life. God wants to love you. And in loving you, begin to walk through places where he can let his love cast out your fear. And I think many times the Spirit of God will use other people to help cast out fear as well. When Israel is going to go occupy the promised land, there's this really interesting set of instructions. Deuteronomy 20, verse 8 says, Is anyone afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home so that the others will not become disheartened too. In an army, in a workplace, in a ministry, negativity, fear, and discouragement are all contagious. But so is this trusting and love of who God is. This is why we are called to encourage one another. Guys, when we are in places where we feel so down, you get around people who love Jesus and encourage you to have your focus back upon who he is. Let them pray for you. When you look at these verses that, you know, the Lord is at hand, do not be anxious, but pray about everything. That actually goes on, Philippians 4, 7, and says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the whole context because it's moving to our focus. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God literally means the peace that God himself has in his own eternal being. That peace is going to come and guard your hearts and minds. Maybe not from all your anxiety, but it's going to guard you in the place where your anxiety leads you to places of fear and lack of faith. God still guards you because he is the one who holds our salvation secure in his hand. Paul uses a military term here, the word guard. Guard is a term that Greeks would use for soldiers when they guarded a city. And the promise of God that he is the one who stands guard over our hearts and our minds. And it's beautiful. And this is why we believe that prayer is the single most fundamental spiritual discipline when it comes to putting off anxiety and putting on peace. Now what Element is going to do, I'm going to show you this real quick. What Element's going to do as soon as this series is done, in about three weeks... Is we're going to start a series, and it's going to go through the end of the year, and it's called Prayer. We just got our booklets, and we put these together for you like we do every once in a while. We're going to hand these out in a couple weeks, and what our goal is for the first eight weeks, we're going to talk about what prayer is and what prayer isn't, and all these different things about prayer. In the last five weeks, we're going to show you people and how they prayed in the Bible. We're also, if you're so inclined and you want to start trying, we will also give you an Element Prayer Journal. And you can start writing down some prayers in that prayer journal. Now, uh, I might get in trouble with the board because we just paid for this and so I'm over budget. Um, but <laughs> makes me a little anxious. Um, <laughs> Well, they only cost us about five bucks, so if you, want, if you give online, throw extra five bucks in, that'll help. Uh, <laughs> but turning any and every care over to God is kind of the part that we get to play in allowing the peace of God to stand guard over our hearts and, and our minds. And if you want three points this morning, I guess, I guess it would be, you know, focus on Jesus, understand the gospel, and trust God to guard you. Have your focus go back. And I was trying to think of a way to kind of bring this whole message together. And uh, my friend Pete Newman says, you always put a bow on the end of your message. Like, you always tie it up really nice. So I'm trying to think how to do that. Um, there's an old story I think I told you guys years ago. Um, John Ortberg told it. I heard him. And he was talking about his daughters, and they were three and five years old. And he said, they're on vacation. They're at this place that had a pool. And the, the ground's all wet. And he tells his daughters, look, the concrete gets wet. It gets slippery. So don't run around the pool because you're going to slip and fall and bonk your head and fall in the pool. And you're going to drown. So don't. Don't do that. Like, teach your kids not to be anxious, right? <laughs> and so don't do that. You know, it's kind of like what God says to us. Like, hey, listen to me. Trust me. Walk with me. Got it. Because what do three to five-year-olds do? They start running around the pool, just like we do when God says, hey, don't do this. Got it, God. And you run into your thing. And so they're running around the pool, and one of the kids slips, whoo, falls, bonks their heads, rolls in the pool. And his, he sees this, right? And he runs over instantly, and he grabs his daughter, and he pulls her out of the pool. And she is just sobbing. She's like, oh, daddy. Oh, daddy, I drowned. I drowned. Oh, my goodness, I drowned, daddy. And he's all, no, 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 you didn't. You weren't even close. So let's not tell your mom about this. <laughs> And he says, and he says, why? He goes, she wouldn't understand what I know. And this is what he says, that your father is watching you the whole time. And the moment you slipped, that was so scary to you. Your father is plenty strong enough to grab you and pull you out of the water. And you're right here in my arms, perfectly safe, more alive than ever. Guys, that is not just good news. It's true news. 
And this is what the gospel brings, that God loves us. You may slip, you may fall when you're in a relationship with him. His hands will have you. And so we trust God's peace. Nothing can take you from the arms of the Father. So we let God's words about his care for us wash over us in those moments that we are so full of anxiety. And we let that grace and the goodness of God bring us closer because we understand his grace is more powerful than our fear and our anxiety and worry. And we should read these verses in context and understand ultimately that in the gospel, this is what God did to come and alleviate us of all the things that really want to overwhelm our lives. Because we want to focus on all the ways we have to figure it out, how we have to do it ourselves, how we have to understand everything. And I'll tell you in the end what we need to understand is God's great love given to us in the gospel that he has brought us back to himself. You may have a million things in your life going on right now that you feel like is just overwhelming you. In these next few moments, you get an opportunity to set that aside. And you can say, you know, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And when you say, what can man do to me? That includes you. That includes you. It is God's rescue. It is God's grace. It is God's peace. It is God's hope. That we look towards. And this is why every week we come to communion. Because it's a place where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. You have so many things going on in your life. You do this to remind yourself of what I have done to rescue and save you. And this is why you break that cracker like Christ's body was broken for us. And you dip it in the wine or the grape juice as a reminder of his blood that was shed for us. Because our body, our blood, we can't pay for our own sins. But he does. And so brings us back to relationship with God in himself. And so we get to be a people who experience life and hope and salvation. And no matter how hectic and how bad things get in this world, Jesus is sovereign and he is true and he has rescued us. And that should help us to give something to focus on in the midst of our anxieties and worries. Again, I'm not saying that they're all going to disappear, but I'm saying they can actually begin to dissipate when our focus becomes what it needs to become. If you need prayer, maybe you are overwhelmed by anxiety this morning and everything I said just made you more anxious. I'm sorry. (laughs) But uh, talk to Sarah at the Welcome Center. She will connect you with one of us and we'd be able to pray with you this morning and maybe help reset your focus back to the gospel and back to understanding who Jesus is in the midst of this thing that is bringing you great anxiety because we want to be a people who first and foremost focus on the gospel. There's offering boxes next to all the doors we give because God gave so much to us. Giving is part of our worship. It's a response to what he has done. Sometimes anxiety rears its ugly head when it comes to giving. Am I going to have enough? I'm going to do this. Guys, we, we trust God and we give because he's given to us. It's simple and it's joyous. And that's how it's meant to be done. Uh, I also encourage you to grab the sermon notes. Take those verses there. You can look through those. You can uh, take those questions on the back and talk to your friends or your family, your gospel community about these things and remind one another what it means to truly trust God and to walk through this life in places where there is worry, where there can be doubts, where there can be anxiety. But God's grace still stands stronger than all of those. And we can trust him in the midst of the places that we have such great fear and such great anxiety because our God stands good and loving over his people. And he will pull you out of the thing when you slip and fall and bonk your head and want to drown. He pulls you right back out because he loves you. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would take and move us to be a people who begin to understand the gospel better. So that when we come into places that feel so overwhelming, that we cannot understand you know, what the next thing is that we are supposed to do, we can still take a step back and understand that you are the one who has come to save and draw us back to yourself. That our ultimate eternity depends upon you and not upon us. And that in all the things that we keep wanting to do, we need to come back and understand what you have done. At the moment of the cross, at the rescue of our great salvation that we have received. And I ask that that would teach and remind us how to begin to live out in the world in ways that reflect the goodness of who you are. Have us be able, even in the midst of our own worries and anxieties and fears, to step into each other's lives. And to help people to come back and see who you are and what you are doing and who you are calling us to be. God, teach us to have our focus on the great good news of your rescue and your hope and your salvation. 
Have us be a people who worship you because of your majesty and worship you because of the cross and resurrection. And that we would live in this life, even in the places where we have anxiety and worries and fears, but we live with the focus upon you first, even in the midst of those things. And we thank you for being so gracious to us. Amen. Um, as we drop the curtains, just take a couple moments right now and think about what in your life, maybe in the last week, month, year, whatever it is, has brought the most anxiety to you, the most worry. I think that the amazing thing is that when we hit places of anxiety and worry, we start to think that this is it. You know, this is, this is all my life is going to be. And we've got to come back to the place where we understand that God is like, no, no, your life is found in me. It's found in me. And so that is meant to start changing how we live this life, how we see anything that comes our way. And so I don't know what's going on in your life right now. And I hope you do not think that I've said that just get over your anxiety if you have some. What I'm saying is take it to God. Honestly share that with him. Instead of being like, no, I'm fine. I'll buck up. I'll figure it out. Honestly share what is going on right now in your heart with him. And then allow him to draw you to this place of communion where you remember who he is and what he has done. Then allow that to set your life's course, not just for this afternoon, but for the rest of your life. In those moments where anxiety feels so overwhelming, come to the place of the cross, of the gospel, and have that begin to reset so you can begin to walk out in hope and new life again. Searching, oh God, you're near in my wandering, oh God, you're near. When I Apart, we are joined as one by your blood. Hope will rise as 
we become more than conquerors through the one who loved the world. I know death, nor anything else can pull us apart. We are joined as one by your blood. The conquers through the one who loves the world. Don't cry. You never leave my side. And your love will stand for. I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God <laughs> A slave to fear Oh, I am a child You unravel me with the melody. You surround me. Of deliverance from my enemies. To all my fears. chosen me you have called my name and I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my
utterly dependent on you. <laughs> and uh, I pray that um, I pray that uh, we would cast our care and our anxiety on you. Um, and I pray that we would be uh, we would be understanding of, of those around us that um, that are having anxiety that are that are having hard times. That, that we would empathize with them, that we would, um, that we would reach out to them, and that we would minister to them, and that they ultimately would draw closer to you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for saving us. Amen. Well, I was going to probably say a little, my own little bow tie here. But uh, I got nothing, so <laughs> we're going to sing one more song together. Uh, guys, uh, please stand and join us.
people that is empathetic of others and that puts your anxiety and cares on God. I'm, I'm out of words. All right, here we go. <laughs>